The Institute of World Affairs at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee presents International Focus, a weekly discussion of the people and events behind today's global headlines. Support provided by Milwaukee Public Television and the UWM Center for International Education. Now here's your host, Rob Rasigliano. Welcome to International Focus. Our topic today, women, health, and development in Morocco. Throughout the developing world, issues surrounding reproductive rights and maternal and infant health play a significant role in a nation's overall development. In Morocco, the relationship between development and public health involves a complex web of religious, economic, legal, and epidemiological issues. With 15 years of experience in Morocco, our guest today has dealt extensively with these dynamics. Ellen Amster is the Associate Professor of Middle East History in the Department of History at UWM and co-coordinator of the Middle Eastern and North African Studies Certificate Program here. She also serves as co-leader of a program taking students from a variety of disciplines to Morocco to study health and health care. Her forthcoming book, Medicine and the Saints, Science, Islam, and the Colonial Encounter in Morocco is a history of medicine in that North African nation. Ellen, welcome to International Focus. Thank you, Rob. Um, Ellen, as, as we said in the intro, there, there are all these complex forces coming together to affect something that you know everybody can relate to, healthcare, um, but I'm sure is, is very different in how it manifests itself in Morocco. And I'm, I'm wondering if we could kind of unpack some of these issues a little bit, and maybe starting with mm -hmm. the impact of uh, religion on on healthcare, and I know a lot of Americans are familiar with the the flap that happened a, a, a bit ago when the Obama administration required religiously affiliated hospitals um, who didn't want to cover birth control to cover birth control, and there was a religious freedom issue. I'm imagining there are sort of analogs to that in the in a Muslim country like Morocco. Mm -hmm. um, well, I take um, I take students um, uh, to Morocco um, in the summer, and there, there's a number of ways that we that we address this issue. One is um, the Association de Lutte contre le Sida, which is an AIDS NGO, um, who essentially uh, undertook alone the uh, treatment of AIDS. They got in touch with a uh, NGO in France and, and imported um, AIDS drugs to treat uh, patients. They advocate for patients. They managed to get free care for patients from the Moroccan government. Um, but of course, they started to get come under fire from uh, conservative Islamic critics because they distribute condoms, they um, do outreach to prostitutes and men who have sex with men and IV drug users and the usual, as they call them, the vulnerable populations. Um, and they had a, a very uh, clever way of, of managing the, the criticism, which is also to do outreach to imams as peer AIDS educators. and. Um, uh, teach them about uh, AIDS prevention, and many imams became uh, very passionate and supportive um, educators. Um, and the Islamic legal concept that they drew on is khafaf um, al-darar, which is the um, lessening of a, 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 a of a harm. Mm -hmm. And they argued that yes, you know, prostitution and I IV drug use obviously are, are not good, but um, this is something that makes it less harmful. Um, this is one example. The other question is the introduction of emergency contraception to Morocco, mm -hmm. and um, it's, it's available to married couples, but not uh, as easily to unmarried women. Um, um, the, there's also an issue of uh, the change in the government in Morocco with the, the Arab Spring and the, the PGD, which is um, a kind of moderate Islamic party that has come to power. Um, one, of the, one of the NGOs that I, I take students to is, called, uh, uh, is, is run by Aisha Shana. It's called Female Solidarity, Solidarité Féminine. Um, and she um, helps to prevent child abandonment by um, uh, supporting um, unwed mothers. These are usually little girls who are child maids, mm -hmm. generally sent from the Berber countryside. Um, they don't receive an education. They work for a family um, and become pregnant. And then they're 15 years old, um, no education, no money. 
Um, and uh, what this NGO does is give them money to rent a room and uh, give some job training and education um, and food and child care. To, uh, th this NGO actually won uh, the Opus Prize in 2009, um, a million dollars, wow. um, fortunately. <laughs> um, and, um, but Aisha Shanna, the founder, has come under um, criticism um, as uh, immoral and supporting immorality. So it is a, a complex, it, it's but, but a it complex like web. It, I mean, it's a really interesting strategy uh, in your first example of, of, of not opposing or try to undermine the religious orthodoxy, but actually bringing religious leaders into the, the process, which, you know, of actually making them sort of AIDS educators and, and getting them involved in this. And, and it, I, it just sounds like something that, that uh, you know, a lesson maybe we could, we could adapt here in the U.S. too, because we have these some similar kind mm. of uh, objection to a lot of the same, same issues. Um, I'm wondering what, the, what, what students who are seeing this experience or what they think mm. about um, how, what lessons they draw from from mm -hmm. seeing the role of intera the interaction between religion and healthcare? It's not keeping religion out of healthcare, but it sounds more like about f bridging the, the the divide in some way. Um, it's interesting because the physician who runs this AIDS NGO, um, she um, Dr. Um, Rofrani, she wears a headscarf. And she's a, a very diminutive in stature, but mighty in personality. And she, she said, I wanted, and the students were all women. And she said, I want them to see that it's a woman with a headscarf who is running an AIDS NGO, and that this is something that we can all do. And um, I, I, I agree that, the, I mean, the fact is that the imams, um, especially of community mosques, they want, um, What's best for for families? Support for families. Um, you know, the Islamic Party is not necessarily um, unsupportive of health. Quite the contrary, they've um, created a, a new program uh, called Ramed, which is um, provides a free not just free health care, but also free medication, free tests for the the poorest. Um, and this is all part of the Arab Spring. So, I, I think. It, the Islamic framework is just that. It's a large framework within which different actors negotiate. But for the most part, um, religious leaders want the, the, the welfare um, and support of, of families and women and children and health. And so to, to appeal to that um, is, is, I think, very wise. And it's interesting how um, AIDS NGOs in Morocco, in Tunisia, um, and elsewhere in the Islamic world have all adapted to Islamic frameworks. It's not presented quite the same way mm -hmm. as at home. Um, and that there's even been um, cooperation between Israeli and Arab NGOs about AIDS. So mm -hmm. that AIDS and, and these kinds of pandemics, they force a kind of cooperation and openness um, and um, really reconsideration um, from, from many, many actors mm -hmm. in society. So. And, and historically, has the, has, uh, have mosques or, or, or um, religious leaders been involved in, in health care in various ways? I mean, is, that, is, it, is this just another chapter in that, that legacy? That's a, a good point. Um, it used to be that people would go to saint shrines um, um, or, um, or mosques, especially uh, the poor. Um, Islamic property, or which is called waqf, or in Morocco it's called habus, um, often would pay for, for example, a house for the blind, or house for widows, or house for orphans. Um, would um, the first uh, Maristan in Fez, which is a kind of hospital, was paid for also by um, is this uh, waqf for Islamic property. So um, water systems were also waqf for Islamic property. So. Yes, um, really the, the medical system in you know, the, the medieval period, the Renaissance period, um, right um, until almost the colonial period was provided by Islamic institutions. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's a good point. Um, I wonder if we could shift a little bit to talking about um, the context of development in Morocco. I mean, yeah. Morocco is a developing country. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how Morocco's development situation impacts the healthcare sphere. Um, one of the big issues 
um, is the relationship between the countryside and the city. So this issue of child development is largely, uh, child abandonment is largely um, from rapid urbanization and rapid industrialization and urban, uh, rural people coming to the city and young girls being unprotected by family networks. Um, but one of the big problems in Morocco is that um, while the cities have um, very quickly developing infrastructure, the countryside does not. And so I, I take the students to um, Zawit Hansal, which is um, one, the second poorest area in uh, Morocco. It's in the High Atlas Mountains. It's, it's very, very beautiful. It's famous for its climbing, for hiking. Mm -hmm. um, but there are villages that have um, no piped in water. Um, they got electricity eight months before I first came there uh, a couple years ago. They, um, they don't have, um, for example, they, they don't have a, a system for water purification. Um, so um, here we're, um, we're testing the, the, the water quality of the river. Um, uh, so, um, and there, there are connections between um, women's uh, rights and women's status and uh, the environment that are not immediately apparent. So when, for example, a village gets uh, water pipes laid, girls go to school hmm. because otherwise it's up to women and girls to fetch water, which is often at some distance, and uh, carry it back. Um, that uh, the, the the area that we that we work in, um, they don't have a hospital that, uh, especially not for uh, birth. So, women have to go two hours away to the nearest hospital if there's an issue or a complication. Um, so, in a way, one of the big problems um, is the lack of development in rural areas compared to urban areas. How how, how have um, the rural areas? Coped. I mean, what are some of the strategies that they've adopted to try to make up for the fact that there's not this infrastructure, there's not a hospital that can attend to you know women in childbirth? So how, how have how, I mean, I imagine they have to be fairly yeah. creative in how they 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 manage this. These people are amazing. <laughs> they are the most amazing, can-do, self-reliant people I have ever known. <laughs> they they get together and they do it themselves with with almost no means. So. Um, there is um, a, a Moroccan NGO called SMNID, which means forward in Berber, and they partner with an American uh, NGO called the Atlas Cultural Foundation. Um, but SMNID has um, all of the residents, they pooled their resources and they bought um, a hydroelectric uh, generator so that um, although the state did not provide them electricity until you know, about a year ago, they've had electricity for a long time because they bought their own generator and they installed it on the river. Hmm. Um, they created a tutoring program um, to help uh, to help students. They, um, the high school, they only have a school provided by the state up to the sixth grade. Then the kids have to go two hours away to the nearest high school. And a lot of parents don't want their 14-year-old um, girl alone in a strange town. And four hours of commute. You know, to, uh, and who you might see, you know, maybe once a semester. And so they're looking into buying a, a building and making it a dormitory where the, the girls will be protected so that more parents will let their kids go to, their girls go to high school. So they, they are remarkably um, self-reliant. We, we, we've touched on it several times, and, and another issue that I thought maybe we've got a couple minutes before the break, maybe we could start to talk about now, and we'll pick up yeah. after the break, but that's that's the role of women. I mean, you've, you've talked about it mm -hmm. several times, some of these issues, uh, HIV, um, uh, maternal health, and so on, child abandonment, all have to do, all really are, are, are key issues for women and, and, and how men um, uh, support women or work with women. Is there something, what's peculiar about the role of women in Morocco? Well, I think, um I think that the, the UN development goals, right, they say that the, the number one uh, factor that will improve the economic, environmental, educational, nutritional, and health situation of any country is the level of instruction of women. <laughs> number one. So the best, the best return on your investment dollar for dollar is educating women. Um, that if women and girls are, the higher their level of education, the higher their level of enfranchisement and um, legal freedom, 
the faster the development of the country. And I think that this is a priority for the king. I think that the king of Morocco, um, who is a very dynamic, young, um, socially minded um, person, he's, he's really, even when he was the prince, this was a big issue for him, which was uh, welfare and support for the family. Why don't, why don't we stop it there? Sure. We'll, we'll, we'll take our break. We'll be back in just a few moments on International Focus. The Institute of World Affairs presents our community with a range of public programs relating to global issues, U.S. foreign policy, and the world economy. For more information about the Institute of World Affairs, call 414-229-3220 or visit our website at www.iwa.uwm.edu. Welcome back to International Focus. We're talking about women, health, and development in Morocco with Assistant Professor Ellen Amster here at University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. Um, so, uh, Ellen, you were talking about the, the role of women in Morocco, and particularly um, you, just before the break, you were talking about the how first it's a it's a it's a one of the highest leverage investments you can make in a developing country is is the education of women, and also that the king in Morocco is quite sympathetic to supporting or. Uh, furthering the role of women in society. I wonder if you could just kind of pick up on that and, and talk more about, about the role women play and, the, and how Morocco is, is, is dealing w with, with women. Um, that's a, it's an interesting question. Um, one issue, for example, is the, the changes in the mudawana, which is the, the family code, the family legal code that covers divorce and marriage, um, affiliation, inheritance. Um, the first Mudawana was uh, drafted right after independence in, I believe, 1957. And there was a significant reform that was proposed um, uh, in, in 2000, and then there was significant resistance to it from the most uh, right wing of the, the Islamist groups. Um, it was proposed by a, a variety of, of um, women's organizations and human rights organizations and uh, democratically minded uh, parties in Morocco and socialists. And um, the decisive factor was the support of the king. And so um, raising the age of marriage, um, allowing uh, divorce to be consensual, a number of a, a number of real improvements in the status of women. And that was um, largely through um, the support of the of of the king personally. Um, and I, I, I should also mention that Aisha Shanna um, um, in, an, in an interview that I had with her, and she's a, a very um, She's a, a very outspoken lady, as you can imagine. Um, she said that the the king personally reached out to her and said, "You don't, you don't have to worry. Um, you know, um, we you're under our protection." Hmm. So he he's um, he's a very socially minded um, person as well. I wonder if we could shift gears a little bit and and, and talk some about um, the students that you're bringing uh, on your trips to Morocco, mm -hmm. and and some what is the big lessons or impressions that they, whether you intend or not, that they come uh -huh. away, they come away from their time in, in Morocco, studying about Morocco and their time in Morocco, visiting urban areas and rural areas. What, mm -hmm. what, what are the big insights or the, 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 the themes that they come away with? Um, I think the best would be to ha interview them. <laughs> so I, um, I'll, I'll just try to um, uh, put together a, a little bit some of the things that they, that, that they shared with me. Um, um, one is how Im impressed they are with, um, they were mostly women activists who were um, working on behalf of women um, in the healthcare sector, in the rural area, um, from uh, Aisha Shanna to um, Dr. Hofrani to um, a, 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 a lady called Miriam who um, does not have an education but created a women's NGO in the High Atlas Mountains to improve um, uh, conditions for women there and rights for women there. So I think um, the tremendous uh, strength of, of these different um, kinds of women activists and one of my students, um, who's a nursing student, um, she said, uh, can you translate this for me as she approached uh, Dr. Hofarani, who she towered over, she said, she said, I, I wanna tell her I admire you so much. 
I want to shake your hand. <laughs> um, I think that, that was one um, factor. I think because the students live with families, then they see how very differently people live, in some ways very differently and, and in some other ways very similar. Um, they take colloquial Arabic so that they can have some um, conversational ability um, with the family and with, and with people. But uh, the way that families uh, share food, share uh, work, share um, space, uh, share uh, possessions, I think, um, and uh, the kinds of challenges, too, that women face in the third world that we take for granted in the first world, especially access to um, birth control, um, certain kinds of uh, legal guarantees and protections. Um, one of the, one of the um, colleagues that speaks to the students um, is from um, Global Rights, which is a human rights NGO. Um, and um, she speaks to them about violence against women and about marital rape and um, different um, uh, le legal issues involved with um, uh, protections that women do or, or don't have um, uh, against different kinds of violence. So. Are, are the things that they, they, they come away from your, your time in Morocco back to the U.S. and say, well, uh, I can take this to the U.S., right? Things that, 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 that maybe, whether they're nursing students mm. or from um, public health or water, uh, things that they, insights they might want to say, hey, maybe we could learn something like this, or maybe this is an idea we could, for something they could do here in the, in the U.S.? Um, well, one of, um, I would say both. Um, on the one hand, I had a, a student who's interested in teaching in Pakistan um, and in doing women's education in Pakistan. And when we were in the mountains, um, uh, the Atlas Cultural Foundation um, brought a colleague, um, Genevieve Chabot, who's, who's now in Pakistan, who had worked with Greg Mortensen of the Three Cups of Tea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and um, they had the students plan a community health day um, in which they feature a certain thing, whether it's hand washing or uh, food safety, um, and had the students um, create their own community health day, and they had some terrific, um, terrific ideas. Um, and one of the students said, I really want to apply the same kinds of things that I've learned here to Pakistan, because there's a way in which this is um, an introduction to working in the third world and experience living in the third world and uh, just some of the day-to-day -day issues that are, uh, and mm -hmm. also the importance of sensitivity to cultural issues. Um, it's very important to, uh, for example, be appropriately dressed um, because everyone in the rural area is talking and the Ministry of, of Interior has a very close eye also on foreigners' movements in rural areas. So um, things that, that they wouldn't necessarily right. think of. For the U.S., I think, especially for the students who are, who are involved in, uh, uh, there were two nursing students um, who are, and um, two other students who were then interested in, in um, pursuing perhaps a master's in public health. Um, is sensitivity to other um, ideas of health and healing, um, other cultural traditions about the body, the ways that uh, different um, family structure impacts decision making about disease, about going to the doctor, about medication, mm -hmm. um, because this uh, sensitivity to different cultures is a, an issue, for example, in Wisconsin sure. in the in the healthcare system. Yeah. Um, we have just a few minutes left, and we, we mentioned your book at the beginning, Medicine and the Saints. And I'm wondering if you could if you could talk a little bit about that book and maybe how it picks up on some of the themes that that you look at when you when you go to Morocco. Oh, great! Thanks. Um, the sixth chapter of my book is um, largely about maternal and infant health in Morocco, and this course is an expansion of some of the themes. Um, one of the things that I trace is the um, development of tuberculosis in Morocco from. Um, from not terribly significant to a real epidemic. And what um, Larbi Idrisi, who is the former director of the National Institute of Hygiene, um, introduced me to is the way that AIDS and TB now piggyback on each other. Um, because TB also has a very long um, series of treatments that because a lot of people either um, can't afford the medication or they can't, because of work demands, can't always uh, do it regularly, that um, uh, drug-resistant TB is developed in Morocco, and then that becomes very difficult to, to treat. Um, 
I look at also the, the introduction, um, it's only at the very end of the French protectorate period, the introduction of um, maternities, and it's the first time that French physicians really deliver a lot of uh, Moroccan women, and they found um, a number of important things that are still important. Um, one is that there were women who would give birth to two or three healthy babies, and then they would need a C-section, when it's usually becomes easier. And what would happen is that these women had such severe malnutrition that the pelvic girdle would collapse um, and they needed, you know, vitamin D and, and <laughs> calcium and, um, um, and issues about malnutrition and birth um, are, are, are still uh, a problem, especially in these very remote areas. Um, and um, some of the physicians who had been in Morocco, then they transition and become, they enter the World Health Organization, the, the, the director of the national, uh, or I should say the Protectorate Health Service, his uncle founded UNICEF, and mm. he, he um, enters UNICEF. So there are, I think, a lot of lessons to, to learn from right. the past. And if people want that, they'll have to read your book, Medicine yeah. of the Saints, uh, and, and learn more about, about Morocco. Ellen, Assistant Professor Ellen Amster, thank you very much for insights into women, health, and development in Morocco. And to our viewers, we'll see you next week on International Focus. For information about the Institute of World Affairs and its many programs, or to become a member of the Institute, call 414-229-3220 or visit us at our website, 